Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Today we will talk about very important topic that is justicial tube dysfunction. And before embarking upon this topic, you are requested to check the videos in which we have discussed the uh, anatomy and physiology of the justicial tube and then different tests by which we can check the uh, potency of the justicial tube. Uh, because until and unless we have a clear idea of uh, these topics, we could not understand today's topic. Uh, and the, these links for those videos are there in the description. So you are requested to check out those before going through this video. So the Eustachian tube, when it becomes blocked, that is functional failure of the Eustachian tube, what will happen? That its important function, that is ventilation of the middle ear is hindered. And due to that hindrance, there will be increased negative middle ear pressure, which can lead to atelectasis of the tympanic membrane and the middle ear cavity, leading to retraction pocket in the attic or posterior quadrant. And there can be adhesive type of otitis media. The, the usually the etiology for uh, this uh, problem or inflammation is due to infection or allergy. In the upper respiratory tract infections, so children with uh, uh, frequent upper respiratory tract infections, reflux disease in younger children is uh, one of the important causes. Then exposure to tobacco smoke, whether you are active smoker or passive smoker because smoke impairs the mucociliary function. Then primary ciliary dis, uh, disorder. Uh, which leads to increased viscosity of the secretions. So mucociliar, this uh, drainage becomes hampered uh, during pregnancy and those ladies who are on an oral contraceptive pills due to high progesterone states, similar situation can occur. So anatomical obstruction of the eustachian tube, uh, for example, from uh, neoplasms that is less common as compared to these allergic and inflammatory causes leading to eustachial tube dysfunction. But this adenoid hypertrophy, it encroaches on the torus tuberius. It causes the mechanical obstruction. Then the contraction of the pharyngeal constrictors during swallowing can press an enlarged adenoids into the torus tuberius and force it interiorly to close the tubal orifice instead of dilating it open. So that can be a major cause. Dilatory dysfunction may be due to hypoactive, hyperactive or uncoordinated contractions of tensor villi palatini and levator villi palatini muscles. Hypoactive tensor villi palatini muscle, it causes the decrease in anterolateral wall dilatory movement and it reduces the lateral excursion of the anterolateral wall in the final step of dilatation. And uh, all these mechanisms I have talked about when we discussed the anatomy and the physiology of the eustachian tube. So you are requested to check that video in detail, please. Then excessive contractions, these have been observed in both tensor villi palatini and levator villi palatini muscles, which leads to a bulky mass effect thereby paradoxically impairing the valve dilatation. A structural compromise or defect of the eustachian tube can be a rare cause. Then familial predisposition for tubal dysfunction, cleft lip or cleft palate, then craniofacial abnormalities like seen in Down's syndrome children. These are rare causes. The primary disorders of the mucosa or the submucosa, this can be Wagner's disease or there can be granulomatous, other granulomatous diseases. Then Samter's triad and the Samter triads we know it is associated with asthma, nasal polyps and aspirin uh, sensitivity that can lead to tubal blockage. So the tubal blockage, if it is there, it will lead to absorption of the middle ear gases negative pressure in the middle ear leading to the retraction of the tympanic membrane then there will be transudate in the middle ear or even hemorrhage can occur if there is prolonged tubal blockage or dysfunction then otitis media with effusion and atelectasis or even there can be perforation of the tympanic membrane or there can be retraction pocket which can lead to cholesteatoma and that ultimately can lead to erosion of the incostapedial joint so this blockage you can be mechanical 
these mechanical can be intrinsic factors or intrinsic factors intrinsic is those diseases which are you know involving the mucosa or submucosa like inflammatory causes in upper respiratory tract infection or allergies extrinsic may be mechanically when when it is being obstructed by the adenoids hypertrophy or by the nasopharyngeal carcinoma or that that, that carcinoma you know is uh, eroding the bones leading to bone necrosis and then in the lumen uh it is you know uh, metastasizing locally then there can be functional disturbance due to the collapse of the eustachian tube that it is not dilating properly or there can be a combination of the two so endoscopy of the eustachian tube in patients with the eustachial tube functions they have identifiable pathology within the cartilaginous portion one is that insufficient dilatation and the other one is patulous eustachian tube in insufficient insufficient dilatation of the eustachian tube that uh, it is most common type and this is most commonly due to insufficient dilatation rather than true blockage of the lumen the most common finding is mucosal inflammation within the cartilaginous eustachian tube and the inflammation involves the lymphoid tissue in the torus tuberius and the glandular mucosal surfaces of the nasopharyngeal orifice and the mucosa closer to the isthmus is typically much less inflamed while the mucosa towards the nasopharyngeal end of the eustachian tube is more commonly involved in insufficient dilatation then there can be the failure of proper closure of the tubal valve leading to patulous eustachian tube which is the next common uh, finding on endoscopy you can see the inflamed torus tuberius and lymphoid hyperplasia leading to the obstruction of the nasopharyngeal end of the eustachian tube uh, mucosal edema near the orifice it is found in 83% in many series uh, st uh, the study has concluded this then reduced anterolateral movement of the eustachian tube due to thickness of the inflamed mucosa in 74% of the cases and adjacent inflammation in the adenoids is very common then we can check the tests of our eustachian tube potency and this is the list of these tests the details of these tests uh, it is there in a separate video the link of that video is there in the description so you can check out the details of all these tests in that video so i just skip it over there then uh, symptoms of tubal occlusion will lead to of course hearing loss which will be conductive type of popping sensation patient may complain of otalgia may be dull ache it may be there then tinnitus and disturbance of the equilibrium can also be there on examination there will be retraction of the tympanic membrane and there will be signs of retraction if congestion is there that congestion will be only along the handle of the medius of the in the past tensor and there may be transudate behind the tympanic membrane visible on otoscopy so clinical causes uh, from this discussion you can have very well uh, uh, idea that usually it is uh, inflammatory causes due to the edema of the torus tuberius or the edema of the mucosa and submucosa at the nasopharyngeal end of the eustachian tube so upper respiratory tract infections allergy sinusitis nasal polypi deflected nasal septum leading to post nasal discharge and sinusitis these can cause then hypertrophic adenoids or nasopharyngeal tumors or mass can mechanically obstruct it or the tumor you know can spread through the eustachian tube and then cleft palate submucous cleft palate or down syndrome due to craniofacial anomalies can lead to eustachian tube dysfunctions so mucosal disease is the most common cause of dilatory dysfunction as we just came to the conclusion after this discussion uh, so the, there will be medical treatment for this eustachial tube dilatory dysfunction but the most important is to identify the underlying etiology so if it is allergy so we have to go for the treatment of the allergy and as you know the treatment of the allergy uh, at uh, the foundation of that is to avoid the allergen and then oral or nasal antihistamines nasal topical steroid drops and sprays mast cell stab uh, stabilizer sprays are available and leukotriene inhibitors can be used so allergy should be dealt with on its own merit if there is a recurrent nasal or sinus infections they should be treated uh, as uh, indicated 
whether it needs uh, medical treatment or a surgical treatment accordingly granulomatous diseases uh, if some uh, is found there as a basic cause then it has to be dealt with immunosuppressant drugs laryngopharyngeal reflux is very common especially in children and uh, if it is the underlying cause then we have to go for behavior and dietary modifications anti reflux medications and fundoplication surgery in very severe cases we have to consider about on its own merit true anatomical obstruction it requires contrast enhanced imaging to determine the etiology and identified benign or malignant lesions they may uh, indicate their excision as the definitive treatment adenoids as i told just uh, mentioned that it is one of the important uh, cause for the justitial tube dysfunction that not only mechanically they obstruct the justitial tube opening but they act as a reservoir for a pathogenic organisms so uh, repeated inflammation of the mucosa and sub mucosa of the nasopharyngeal end of the justitial tube can occur from the bacteria which are actually uh, there present there in the adenoids and then inflammatory mediators in allergy they cause the uh, tubal uh, blockage so adenoids they can cause otitis media with effusion or recurrent acute otitis media so if adenoids are considered as the culprit for justitial tube dysfunction we should consider the removal of these adenoids which we call as adenoidectomy and uh, this is the place you know this is the justitial tube opening and you can see in the vicinity of the justitial tube opening uh, mechanically they are present there so if their size is hampering um, the opening of the justitial tube we should consider the adenoidectomy and on endoscopic examination you can see huge mass of adenoids which is obstructing the justitial tube opening so adenoidectomy in dilatory dysfunction especially if the hypertrophied adenoid tissue reaches the torus tuberius it endures good results endoscopic assisted adenoidectomy permits more complete removal of the tissue encroaching the torus and it further allows for some debulking of the hypertrophic tissue of the torus if considered necessary so persistence of dilatory dysfunction despite optimal medical and surgical management of the underlying diseases indicates that it is now irreversible mucosal injury has occurred already so if this is the situation we come across then the options which are left with us is either the use of corticosteroids or we can go for tympanostomy tubes that is the grommet insertion in the tympanic membrane to bypass the eustachian tube to ventilate the middle ear from the external ear instead of from the eustachian this nasopharyngeal end or we can go for eustachian tube tuberplasty or we can consider about the balloon dilatation but this is only when we have dealt with the underlying cause for eustachian tube function whether it was rhinosinusitis or allergic rhinosinusitis or adenoids or nasopharyngeal carcinoma or cleft palate or cleft lip was there that underlying cause has been dealt with but if still there is persistence of eustachial tube dysfunction then it means that irreversible damage is there and we have to consider about these options so these tympanostomy tubes they alleviate the negative pressure in the middle ear so they will relieve the tympanic membrane retraction effusions and atelectasis and effusion or inflammation that continues despite tubes in place may indicate a primary mucosal disorder thick glue like effusions they are associated with upregulation of the genes causing increased protein production so these conditions will frequently respond to oral or topical corticosteroids Eustachian tube tuberplasty it is a safe and possibly effective surgical option for the patients with dilatory dysfunction and candidates for eustachian tube tuberplasty are chronic tubal dilatory dysfunction despite maximum medical therapy and recurrent tube placements due to either extrusion or recurrence of the symptoms tube here means tympanostomy tubes in the tympanic membrane so dilatation of the lumen by surgical debulking facilitates the dilatory action of the tensor villi palatini muscles 
so it removes irreversibly diseased mucosal tissue allowing allowing the regrowth of the healthy mucosa submucosal tissue and the cartilage within the valve region may be removed but the mucosa is consider conserved to prevent the synechia uh, the adhesions and this is accomplished i either by using a laser or by a micro debrider so important is to preserve the mucosa and only go for submucosa and underlying cartilage so inflamed soft tissue and the cartilage they are removed as indicated from the luminal side of the posteromedial wall beginning from the leading edge of the torus tuberius and extending up to or into the valve avoid the injury to the anterolateral wall so tensor villi palatini is present there and avoid the contact with the internal carotid artery so this is in this picture you can see the edematous uh, this uh, torus tuberius and with the help of the laser this fibrous mucosa and soft tissue is uh, removed and a portion of cartilage here you can see that was protruding into the lumen that has been you know cut and it is there in the cup forceps and this piece is being removed and here you can see this completed the operation healed with the mucosal and submucosal defect and olive tipped curved suction is retracting the torus tuberus medially for the exposure so this you can see pre operative and this is post operative you can see the opening now very well it is there after laser surgeries again you can see this is the resting position and this is dilated position here you can see the dilatory function is well now after laser surgeries so 38% of 13 adults they had the remission of their effusion after this laser surgery but overall improvement rate was 68% and there was no significant complications in this study so failure of laser tuberosity is correlated with the presence of allergies or laryngopharyngeal reflux or some other underlying cause i am again and again stressing upon the treatment of the underlying cause so if still allergy is there or laryngopharyngeal reflux is there that can lead to the failure of laser tuberosity or any other surgical procedure which you have gone for for the restoration of the ustichial tube functions so it need to continue to manage any underlying conditions post operatively even then balloon uh, tuberosity most recently balloon dilatation of the cartilaginous ustichial tube has feasibility safety and early clinical application cadaveric studies using balloon dilatation catheters or tubal dilatation proved to be effective with the minimal risks minor tears in the mucosal lumen can be there or failure to rotate the torus medially and neither osseous cartilaginous fracture nor trauma to the internal carotid so this is pre operative resting position no opening of the ustichial tube is visible a guide catheter is inserted into the tubal lumen the balloon catheter inserted up to 16 mm depth and then it is inflated to 12 atmospheric pressure for 2 minutes and then widened lumen you can see and minimal mucosal lacerations they are appreciated so this was all about the uh, ustichial tube dysfunction due to insufficient dilatation but if there is excessive dilatation or excessive opening which we call as patulous ustichial tube dysfunction it refers to persistence patency of the ustichial tube lumen air and sound passes unrestricted between the nasopharynx and the middle ear space and it disturbs the amplified perception of one's own voice that's what we call as autophony and sensation of oral fullness and even otalgia can be there and it is worsens with nasal steroids or decongestants so here what happens is that ustichial tube is abnormally patent it may be there it may be idiopathic or if someone is on diet and there is rapid weight loss in pregnancy especially in the third trimester and multiple sclerosis can be the underlying cause chief complaints as i said is autophony one's own voice is disturbing hearing his own breath sounds pressure changes in the nasopharynx are easily transmitted to the middle ear and movement of the tympanic membrane can be seen with inspiration and expiration normal inspiration and expiration no need for 
time these are was cell was maneuver so there will be abnormal patency of the eustachian tube you can see here even in the resting position this orifice is open while we know that normally the cartilaginous portion remains closed and it opens only periodically so dramatic and substantial weight loss as i just mentioned it can happen during post pregnancy cachectic diseases dietary weight loss bariatric surgery if someone has gone one third have an associated systemic rheumatological disorders and still one third may be idiopathic so these are the causes for patulous eustachial tube uh, abnormal patency so there will be loss of convex bulge in the anterolateral wall underdeveloped lateral cartilaginous lamina less postman's fat pad exercise frequently initiates or exacerbates the symptoms and they tend to appear in the supine or head dependent positions so excretion of the tympanic membrane during nasal breathing while the opposite nostril is being held shut so on impedance tympanometry uh, there will be a uh, sawtooth like protrusion of the tympanograms so medical management of a patulous eustachian tube is that restoration of the healthy humidified mucosa and competence by discontinuation of the decongestants discontinue topical nasal corticosteroids increase the fluid intake and adding the nasal saline drops or irrigations to improve hydration of the mucosa then saturated solution of potassium iodide which enhances the viscosity of the mucus boric acid salicylic acid powder silver nitrate nitric acid and phenol it causes the tissue inflammation and thus increase the mucus production the off label use of premarin or depo estradiol estrogens cause localized mucosal hypertrophy and thus temporary closure of the eustachial tube so these all these can be used while the surgical treatment of patulous eustachian tube is that with the tympanostomy tube placement is it is effective for oral fullness and tympanic membrane excursions Here you can see these are two different types of uh, this uh, grommets are tympan tympanostomy tubes and here one tympanostomy tube is in situ in the tympanic uh, membrane to alleviate the autophony the complete occlusion of the eustachial tube lumen can be considered and uh, this can be achieved by occluding the eustachian tube with bone wax which is commercially available or occluding it with a fat graft or alternatively we can use an autologous cartilage to occlude the abnormally patent eustachian tube or an intravenous catheter filled with bone wax can be employed in this off label application this is the uh, tubal orifice before intervention you can see it is patent then a catheter is introduced into the lumen it is being positioned into the tubal orifice and the catheter is firmly wedged into the bony cartilaginous isthmus and the catheter is there in its final position you can see at the level of the torus tuberius so that the lumen is narrowed of abnormally patent patulous eustachian tube so in cleft palate there can be tubal dysfunction due to abnormalities of the torus tuberius and there can be tensor villi palatini does not insert into the torus tuberius and otitis media with effusion is common in these patients in uh, down's syndrome the tubal dysfunction is due to poor tone of tensor villi palatini and abnormal shape of the nasopharynx barotrauma is a non superative condition resulting from failure of eustachian tube to maintain the middle ear pressure at ambient atmospheric level and the cause may be rapid descent during air flight or underwater diving or compression in pressure chamber so when atmospheric pressure is more than middle ear pressure by critical pressure of 90 mm of mercury that there is a difference of uh, nasopharyngeal pressure from middle ear pressure 90 degree or more this eustachian tube it gets locked 
resulting in the middle negative pressure in the middle ear and leading to tympanic membrane retraction and there can be transudation or even hemorrhage can occur in those cases so from all this discussion the conclusion uh, different conclusions we can have the conclusion number one is that a proper function of the eustachian tube is essential for aeration clearance that is drainage and protection of the middle ear the conclusion number two is that disorders of the eustachian tube commonly they have identifiable pathology within the cartilaginous portion of the eustachian tube and from the cartilaginous portion of the eustachian tube mostly at the nasopharyngeal end because the mucosa which is nearer to the isthmus is usually less inflamed that's what we just discussed in our discussion and conclusion number 3 is that in majority of the cases uh, these can be managed conservatively and in very selective cases the surgical intervention for eustachial tube disorder is now feasible and possible so with that we come to the end of this uh, discussion you are requested to like share and subscribe the channel and thanks for watching